Welcome to our seminar. Today, we're gonna have this talk that is sponsored by the Environmental and Natural Resources Program. And the, call is, the talk is called Think Globally, Act Locally, the Determinants of Local Policymakers Support for Climate Policy. The paper has been written by Joshua Schwartz, who is a PhD candidate at uh, the University of Pennsylvania, and also a Grand Strategy Security and Statecraft Fellow with the International Security Program here at Harvard. And also by Sabrina Arias, who is, my, who is a friend of mine, and who is also a political science PhD candidate at the University of Pennsylvania. So they will present for around 30 minutes, and then we'll be, we will open the floor for any questions you may have. I will kindly ask you that you submit your questions in the Q&A so they can then respond to them. So the floor is yours, guys. Awesome. Thank you so much. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. Great. Well, thank you uh, all for coming and a special thanks to Santiago for serving as moderator and Liz for organizing the seminar. So Sabrina and I are both really excited to present and get your feedback on this project, which we think provides at least a semi-optimistic take about the future of climate progress. So jumping right in, way back in 2015, 195 countries reached the landmark Paris Agreement in order to address climate change. However, as we all know, just a few months after assuming office, President Trump announced his intention to withdraw the United States from this historic agreement. And Trump's action, while eventually reversed, is really reflective of a broader trend, which is the limited success of efforts at the federal level to combat climate change. So for example, during um, Obama's presidency, the Waxman-Markey climate bill failed in the Senate. Um, and of course, Biden's Build Back Better bill um, with its half a trillion dollars of climate change funding is currently on life support and may just be completely dead. Now, although the lack of sufficient progress at the federal level to combat climate change is certainly disappointing, more optimistically, local governments have been stepping up to meet this challenge. So for instance, after Trump's withdrawal from the Paris Agreement, over 400 mayors across all 50 states committed to upholding its emissions targets as part of the We Are Still In campaign. As Salt Lake City Mayor Jackie Biskupski said, we must lead where the White House refuses to. Um, and besides the campaign to uphold Paris, local governments are also joining international initiatives to combat climate change um, and developing their own climate action plans, many of which set pretty highly ambitious targets like carbon neutrality. Consequently, um, although American politics has nationalized in recent years, Progress on climate change has been a more bottom-up phenomenon compared to other policy issues. So given the importance of local environmental initiatives to combating climate change, Sabrina and I asked two research questions in this project. First, what factors impact whether local policymakers decide to support climate plans? And second, do local policymakers and members of the public have congruent or contradictory climate preferences? And we believe that this first question is important because policymakers are the key decision makers that directly choose whether to support or oppose local climate initiatives. So this means that even if there's you know, broad support among the public for certain policies, say gun control, um, a lack of support among policymakers can still prevent these policies from being adopted. And we also believe that answering this question would address two gaps in the literature. First, while many studies have analyzed the views of the American and global public, very few focus on the preferences of policymakers themselves. And then second, the, the few studies that do, while certainly extremely valuable, often focus on descriptive rather than causal relationships, um, or they utilize state or region specific samples rather than national samples of policymakers. And despite some studies that show a null effect of policy design on support for climate policy, um, we expect that design will generally matter because different policy designs should have distinct political, economic, and environmental implications, which should influence policymakers' preferences, at least at the margins. We also believe that addressing our second research question is valuable because policymaker preferences relative to public preferences are important for two reasons. First, if policymakers and the public hold contradictory views on the optimal structure of climate plans, and that's gonna make it um, more difficult 
for climate efforts to yield broad enough support in order to be adopted. And second, wildly divergent views between elites and citizens would raise some thorny questions um, about the representativeness of American democracy on this important issue. And we also think that um, answering our second research question also addresses a current debate in the literature about the existence and extent of elite public gaps. Um, some studies like Harvard's Josh, Josh Kurtzer's meta-analysis in the American Journal of Political Science find that elite public gaps are generally overstated, but then other studies like Del Muth et al.'s recent piece in the American Political Science Review find very large gaps on certain issues like international organization legitimacy. And so we think that our study can help adjudicate this debate, uh, at least for the issue of climate policy, where elite public gaps have generally been understudied. And optimistically, I'd say we generally expect that congruence is more likely than contradictory preferences because policymakers should have political incentives to be responsive to public opinion. Um, and because climate change is such a salient issue, policymakers should be especially attuned to public opinion in this context. And thus we should expect to see uh, congruence rather than contradictory preferences. So to answer our two research questions, we draw on two primary sources of data. First, we leverage a, a unique national sample of over 500 local policymakers that includes mayors, county executives, and council members from across the United States. And then second, we conduct an identical replication on a representative sample of over 1,000 members of the US public, which enables us to analyze whether elite public gaps exist or not. In terms of methodology, we employ a conjoint experimental design which allows us to simultaneously vary many attributes of a climate plan at once um, and make causal inferences about the preferences of policymakers and the public. We specifically vary um, seven attributes of climate plans that fall into three broad categories. First, specific policies. Second, politically relevant endorsements and participants. And then third, structural characteristics. Um, and to give you uh, a brief preview of our results, which uh, Sabrina will talk about in more depth in, in just a little bit, we find that um, a range of climate policy design elements from across these three categories have a significant impact on elite and public support for climate plans, uh, including for Republican policymakers. And in total, we find that about 75% of the treatment effects we analyze are statistically significant. We also find in accordance with our expectations that the preferences of policymakers and the mass public um, are largely congruent. So for example, none of the treatment effects that we examine significantly differ in sign between policymakers and the public, meaning it's, um, it's not the case that one effect is positive and the other effect is negative. And so overall, we believe that the main implication of these results is that climate progress at the local level is indeed possible if plans are strategically designed to maximize support. Okay, so moving into theory, um, will policy design actually impact the willingness of local policymakers to adopt environmental plans? Um, you know, on the one hand, we might expect that maybe not. Um, the, the time and consistency problem associated with climate change whereby um, investing in greenhouse gas emissions, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions today um, may not fully pay off for many generations, could make policymakers unwilling to absorb the short-term costs of environmental action, um, irrespective of policy design. High levels of polarization over climate change could also mean that only partisan signaling will matter. Um, after all, there are, there are many Americans that remain unconvinced that a significant climate problem actually exists, um, and even those that, that are persuaded generally rank environmental issues relatively low on their list of priorities. Um, and then lastly, some studies like Mildenberger et al.'s recent piece on carbon tax rebate programs find that design has only a limited impact on support for environmental policies. However, um, on balance, we do expect that design will matter for a couple of reasons. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, logically, Different policy designs should have distinct political, economic, and environmental implications, which should influence policymakers' preferences, um, at least at the margins. And you know, additionally, there are many studies that find that design does impact public preferences, which should then impact policymaker preferences via political incentives. And so if true, 
And this would mean that the probability of policy adoption can be increased with strategic design, which would be, I think, an important finding. So digging into the details um, uh, of the climate plan attributes we study a bit more, this table shows the, the seven specific attributes we study and their different levels. So for example, I'm looking at the first attribute, we analyze different property tax policies for a couple of reasons. Um, first, property taxes are the largest source of revenue directly collected by local governments, making it a particularly relevant um, policy area to examine for local policymaking. And then second, of course, tax instruments are one of the principal tools that governments can use to combat climate change. So we specifically analyze whether um, environmentally relevant taxes or subsidies, that is tax breaks, um, are more popular among policymakers and the public. And we think that this is a pretty critical um, policy design choice that could potentially make or break support for um, a climate plan. For example, um, Joe Manchin seems quite averse to supporting penalties on fossil fuel companies included in the initial version of Build Back Better, but he was at least ostensibly uh, more willing to support tax subsidies instead, which were in sort of the, the more recent iterations of Build Back Better. Moving on to the, the second um, policy area in this table, we also analyze energy efficiency standards, and we do so because local governments typically have control over building codes, um, and because residential energy usage alone accounts for about 20% of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. The third attribute we analyzed here uh, that you can see in the table is the impact of economic relief, which has been theorized to increase support for climate action, similar to how the literature on international trade argues that compensation can increase support for free trade. Fourth, we probe the impact of partisan endorsements, which um, climate pessimists might argue will essentially swamp the effect of every other factor we um, analyze. And following some prior research, we're particularly interested in whether there might be a backlash effect to plans that are endorsed by only the Democratic Party compared, compared to plans that have um, no partisan endorsements. Fifth, we analyze the impact of international participants in the plan, given that climate change is a global issue, um, and because there are actually international initiatives that uh, focus on climate action at the local level. We specifically assess how um, international participants from in-group states, so for example, countries in Europe, impact support for um, climate plans compared to participants from out-group countries like China, and compared to plans with no international participation. Six, we analyze the impact of when um, the policy actually begins, which we think is a pretty critically important question given the time sensitive nature of addressing climate change. And so including um, this policy enables us to see whether policymakers prefer to defer climate action to avoid potential political costs, or they'd rather take action more quickly in order to more effectively address the threat. Um, and then lastly, we examine whether policymakers are willing to support plans with high short-term costs if doing so yields high long-term benefits, or if instead they prefer uh, plans with low short-term costs and low long-term benefits. We also explore whether policymaker and public preferences are contradictory or congruent, as I mentioned previously. Um, and there are many reasons why prior literature um, has identified for why we might expect elite public gaps to arise, and why we might expect there to be contradictory preferences um, over climate policy. So first, um, elites in the public generally differ in their average demographic characteristics. So for instance, elites are disproportionately um, male, and prior research shows that women are actually more likely to believe in and be concerned about climate change. Second, um, elites and members of the public may have different policy preferences and beliefs. So for example, there's some evidence that policymakers are more likely to believe global temperatures are increasing than the public. Um, and then lastly, um, elites may have more rational and deliberative decision-making processes than average members of the public. Um, still on balance, we generally expect that congruence is more likely for a couple of reasons. Um, first, because again, policymakers have political incentives to be responsive to public opinion. Second, because elite cues themselves can actually impact public opinion, leading to um, further preference convergence. Um, and then lastly, because climate change is such a salient issue, 
policymakers should be especially attuned to public opinion and vice versa, which we would uh, again expect should lead to convergence in opinions. And so with that, let me turn it over to Sabrina to talk about our research design and our results. Great, um, thanks Josh for, for setting this up and thanks so much for having us um, present our work this week. Um, so as Josh mentioned, the particular research strategy that we deploy in order to test our questions is a conjoint experiment, which is a particular type of survey experiment that allows us to test um, all of the different features of our plans uh, varying at the same time. So unlike a more traditional vignette design, um, we're able to capture more of the complexities in decision making that policymakers face on a day to day basis. Um, and in particular, this design allows us to map a little bit more closely to um, behavioral revealed preferences. Of course, as in any survey design, we're only capturing uh, stated preferences, but the unique features of a conjoint design have been shown to better capture behavioral benchmarks than other types of designs um, in the past. So each respondent will uh, select from two climate plans in a series of four tasks. So as you see on the slide, um, this is an example of what one of the tasks looks like. So respondents are asked to choose between the two plans and also to give each plan a, a rating on a scale of one to five. Um, and so within each respondent, the order of the attributes is varied, um, but across all four of the tasks, the order is, is kept constant. And the levels, the, the, the levels for each plan are drawn randomly from a uniform distribution. Um, so this is the, the research design. Um, turning to the results, as you can see here, this is the, the top line results of our study. The left panel here is showing the results for our policymaker sample. And the right is showing the results for our replication in the general public sample. So the quantity that we're showing in this figure is called the average marginal component effect. And what this means is the amount with which a respondent is expected to choose a plan uh, compared to the baseline, randomizing over all of the other, uh, averaging over all of the other attribute levels. So for example, um, a policymaker facing a plan that features all new construction is approximately four percentage points more likely to choose this than the baseline. And for all new construction is approximately three and a half percentage points more likely to choose that plan. So next I'll go into um, more detail on several of our, of our attribute levels um, and discuss the results and the differences that we find between our two samples and also between partisan groups within the populations. So starting with our tax attribute, which Josh discussed before, um, we find a high level of correspondence and preferences amongst both the policymaker and public populations, as well as among partisan groups within those two populations. Um, across the board, our samples favor subsidies over taxes, as we expected that um, subsidizing green energy usage is more favorable compared to imposing taxes on, on exceeding carbon budgets. And the substantive size of this effect is quite large, um, up to nine percentage points in our policymaker sample. Um, although the effects are stronger for the policymakers than the public, the directionality and ordering is, is the same in all the groups. And this suggests that this attribute is very important to take into account in plan design, and that including subsidies in a, in a plan is a way to obtain broad support across the board um, in, in the groups that we examine. Next, our energy efficiency standards attribute. Once again, we find optimistic support for preferences for ambitious plan design across most of our samples. Um, we find that groups favor all new construction over the more limited just government buildings level, as well as favoring all new construction and existing buildings, our most expansive attribute over just government buildings. However, in this case, we do find that heterogeneity exists among partisan groups in our policymaker sample, in that Democrats are more likely to favor the most ambitious plan. But for both of these groups, they're equally likely to favor the middle ground policy, that is all new construction. So while we do observe difference between partisan groups on this attribute, um, we do find a middle ground where there's a high level of agreement. So this suggests that there is a room for political compromise between the preferences of these different groups. 
Next, turning to time to implementation. Once again, we find support for ambitious plans in this area um, in that all of our groups should support shorter over longer timelines. Uh, to recall, we tested two years, four years, and six years on this attribute. We do observe heterogeneity on this um, attribute. Um, once again, we see that Democrats favor a more ambitious plan than Republicans, but um, that the elasticity, that is the, um, the salience of the different levels is smaller for Republicans than for Democrats. Um, similarly, policymakers are more likely to favor quick implementation than the public is. Um, and that the salience of this attribute, the degree to which it moves their preferences is larger for policymakers than the public. So what does this suggest? That fast implementation is possible, there is agreement on that, but perhaps that a more moderate timeline, a four year implementation plan um, could find favor across a broader set of constituencies than the most quick implementation timeline. Next on economic relief, in this case, we do find um, that there is support for economic relief across both of our populations. However, the public is more likely to support broad economic relief than policymakers who are most likely to favor targeted economic relief only to constituents affected by the plan. Um, and so again, what this suggests is that even in cases where there are differences, these differences are, um, can be bridged, there is a middle pathway that would allow all of these groups to be brought on board with a moderate plan um, that targets some economic relief. But this is an attribute that I'll circle back to because we have some interesting findings to discuss with respect to preference intensity when it comes to economic relief. So next, turning to partisan endorsements, we do interestingly find evidence for the backlash effect here. Um, unsurprisingly, bipartisan endorsed plans are favored compared to plans with no party endorsement, but plans with no party endorsement are preferred to plans with only endorsements from the Democratic Party. And this result holds for both Republicans and Democrats. Although it's much stronger for Republicans, even Democrats are less likely to support plans endorsed only by the Democratic Party than they are to endorse plans with no partisan endorsement. And so what this suggests is that partisan perceptions of these plans are an extremely important component to take into account in plan design, and that if it appears that only Democratic endorsements can be obtained for a plan, it may be better for interest groups to pursue a nonpartisan strategy. Now, the conjoint design, as I discussed, is a really useful opportunity for us to see how all of these different attributes simultaneously affect individual preferences over the design of plans. However, they cannot inform us about preference intensity among our sample. That is, which of these attributes were the most important in shaping individual responses to the plans? Did individuals find, for example, that partisan endorsements were a much more important feature than economic relief? To address these questions, we follow our conjoint design by asking respondents what feature was the most important in making their decisions, as well as asking them to explain this decision with an open-ended question. So here we show the most important feature selected by the policymaker sample on the left and the public sample on the right. And as you can see, there are some noteworthy differences. For policymakers, the cost benefit attribute was far and away the most important feature selected by more than a third of respondents. However, for the public, the most important feature was economic relief. We do also observe differences in partisan selection. For example, among our policymaker sample, international participation was much more important for Republicans in the sample than it was for Democrats. So what does this finding suggest? Well, when there are differences between um, the preferences of the different groups, Perhaps we should weight the optimal plan more heavily toward the preference of the group for which it is a more important feature. So we observed that there were differences in preferences on the economic relief attribute with policymakers preferring targeted relief and the public preferring broader relief. Because this design feature is much more important to the public, perhaps the optimal plan should weight toward that preference more heavily and include broader economic relief. And here we illustrate an example of the open-ended response question on the timing attribute. As you can see, the most frequent kind of response that respondents gave for this question was noting the immense time pressure faced in addressing the challenge of climate change. 
So in addition to these main results, we probe into our data quite a bit more. We look for many different uh, subgroups that might have different types of preferences systematically over the climate plans. So we look at heterogeneous effects uh, among many different subgroups. Um, as you can see here, we look at demographic features, constituency level features, and across the board, we find that though there are some examples of heterogeneous effects by different subgroups, um, we don't find huge systematic differences. Um, once again, suggesting that there's a lot of room for common cause in designing climate plans. We also look at some interaction effects between our different attributes. Um, we posited that perhaps when there is political cover provided to policymakers, this can increase their opportunity space to adopt more ambitious plans. So for example, if there is partisan endorsement, does this give policymakers an opportunity to adapt more ambitious design elements um, on the property tax, energy efficiency standard, or cost benefit projection features. Similarly, does broad participation across international groups also allow policymakers to have cover to adopt more ambitious plans? And we find that across these interaction effects, there's not a significant relationship. That is, there is no interaction between the political cover and the ambition that policymakers obtain um, in the structural design elements of the plan. Finally, we probe our results for robustness in a variety of ways. As I mentioned, we ask respondents not only to choose between the two plans and each of the conjoint tasks, we also ask them to rate each of these plans. Though the binary choice measure is found to better replicate behavioral benchmarks, we find that our results are robust to both of these different types of outcome measures. We also estimate all of these results with a marginal mean outcome, which um, addresses concerns about the selection of the baseline level. And again, we find that all of our results replicate in this case. Finally, we test the weighted results. Um, as Joss suggested, there are many different reasons why there may or may not be elite public gaps. And one of these is frequently found to be demographic differences between elites and publics. By employing respondent weights, we're able to control for potential demographic differences. And we find that even by doing so, we still observe no elite public gaps that are substantively large, which suggests that in cases where there are differences in preferences amongst policymakers and the public, these differences are not driven by demographic differences, but rather by actual differences in preferences across these two groups. And we implement two different weighting schemes, one provided by our elite uh, sample partners and one constructed based on census data. And again, in both of these cases, we don't find uh, substantive differences between the main effects that I showed earlier. So to conclude, our key takeaways are that the design of these plans does matter. Um, partisan endorsement, of course, is an important feature of climate plan designs, but the actual policies included in these plans is equally as important. And we showed that many of the substantive design features had effects on plan preferences that were almost as large as partisan endorsement. Similarly, we show that there is not a high degree of elite public gaps when it comes to preferences over climate plans. And that for the most part, there is a high degree of agreement between policymakers and the public and between Republicans and Democrats when it comes to designing local climate plans. So this suggests that climate progress is indeed possible at the local level if these preferences are taken into account and these climate plans are well designed to achieve the optimal level of um, support across different constituencies. So we would love to get your feedback about the framing of our project and how we're situating it in both the policy research and the theoretical research in political science. And we'd also love to know what questions that our work raised for you. What follow-up studies or, or additional questions would you be most interested in, in us to examine next? Because we're really interested in developing a larger research agenda and expanding the scope of this study. So thank you again so much for your attention today. And we're really looking forward to addressing your questions. Thank you, Sabrina, and thank you, Josh. This was really interesting and really a really clear presentation. So while we wait until questions start to show up in the, in the chat, I will just begin by asking you some like comments or like questions that I have after reading your paper. So the first one that I would like to discuss is to what extent 
are these results driven by previous information of like general public or even policymakers? So we know that there is an agreement, you know, we have this problem of climate change, but then, you know, like a specific policies may need different type of information. So you may want to talk about like, I don't know, carbon tax, but the idea of like knowing what a carbon tax is actually may be fair between people. So I don't know if you have information about that, if you actually control for those type of like benchmarks or baseline informations before actually conducting these and pre presenting these results. So I don't know if you have any question, any response. With that. Yes, that's a great question, Santi. Uh, we do not control for baseline awareness of the different features of the plans. Um, we can infer that our respondents are at least aware of the problem of climate change. We do ask them how concerned they are about climate change in our demographic battery. Um, and we can also infer that at least for the policymaker sample, because they deal with these kinds of questions in their day-to-day -day work, it is likely that they are familiar with, with the design features, especially things like building efficiency standards. This is one of the most um, frequent kind of climate um, initiatives that local policymakers are involved in decision-making over. Um, Josh, is there anything that you, you want to add in addressing this one? The only one thing uh, I'll add is that I'm sure some of these preferences are informed by, by prior experience in the sense that, for example, um, I'm sure policymakers have seen that carbon taxes have often failed to achieve public support or been adopted in various referendums. And so I'm sure that's informing their, their preferences in the survey. And so I'm sure there's sort of a bit of an interaction between public opinion and elite opinion um, in the survey. And that's driving some of the preferences here. So I have a follow up on that. So I really like the approach of, you know, thinking about like policy, policy designs and how this can actually affect the support for policies. So my question there, and, I, and it is somehow related to what Josh just, just said. So we know that carbon tax can be like extremely difficult, you know, to like approve because most people don't want to pay more for their like consumption. But there is also evidence that once you show that this carbon dividend that you get from those carbon taxes are used, like whether like in terms of like money that are people getting back or even you know, they're, you're spending them like maybe in social policies, this can actually be, you know, switch. So do you control for those kind of things? So what type of policy signs you include apart from, you know, asking about like a tax? So one thing um, I'll reemphasize that Sabrina mentioned in the latter half of the presentation is that we look at interaction effects. And one of the interaction effects we look at is whether when there's economic compensation, whether then policymakers are more willing to support um, more ambitious climate policy. So, you know, energy efficiency standards that will have a greater impact or quicker implementation times or things like that. And pessimistically, we actually find that that's, that's not the case. And so at least in our study, we're not really finding evidence that um, economic compensation will, will make policymakers more willing to adopt more ambitious uh, policy. And there's definitely some evidence that's more optimistic, but also note the, the Mildenberger et al. piece I, I mentioned, which came out recently, looked at carbon tax rebate programs in, I believe, Canada and was it Swiss, Switzerland, I believe? I think it was Switzerland. And they actually also pessimistically found that the rebate programs didn't actually move the needle much. And so I'd say that's probably one of the more pessimistic findings um, of our study. And feel free to fill in Sabrina if I just anything. Yeah, um, the only other thing I would add is that, um, Santi, your point gets to some great, um, you know, thoughts about the realism of the design and that since we're not actually priming specific costs that would be borne, um, there might be concerns that respondents aren't actually taking these things into consideration. Um, we don't find any evidence of that. Um, we, we do observe that respondents are thoughtfully uh, selecting plans in, in ways that are consistent across tasks and, and such. And um, because our sample accounts for so many different types of municipalities, ranging from really small towns to really large cities, 
benchmarking these things to, to actual numeric values just wasn't something that was feasible to implement. And in fact, I think speaks to one of the strengths of our study is that we have this very diverse representative sample of local policymakers across all these types of municipalities. And we find that there was no difference in their, their plan selection across these different um, you know, percent urban and, and municipal types. Um, so, uh, you know, we had to face this trade off, right? If we had only surveyed medium sized towns, we could have included more realistic cost estimates, um, but we would lack generalizability across across different types of, of representative uh, towns. Thank you. So now I have one comment slash question by Hernan in the chat. So he mentions very interesting webinar. I will try to contact by email the authors of this paper. So meanwhile, I kindly suggest these young researchers, including your follow-up research efforts, the Following Greta Thunberg's remark, the current global climate crisis must be treated, treated as it is. And then he asks, will that direct and frank statement be, I expect the core point to start changing the perspective of how, for instance, USA and other countries like Japan, Norway, or India has so many problems to accept the seriousness of the crisis whose effects are far beyond imagination and the feasible reach of the technology as many technology lovers, fans still believe we can solve this crisis. So do you have any comment or thoughts on that? Um, I think this is a really interesting question. Um, the first thing that occurs to me is that most research finds, at least in the American context, that it's extremely difficult to move attitudes on climate change. So while we might think that such a direct and frank statement that really emphasizes the urgency would be sufficient to move a rational individual's attitudes on climate change and, and increase their willingness to take action, uh, in fact, researcher after researcher in, in political science and environmental governance has, has unfortunately found this isn't the case. And this is largely due to the extreme politicization of, of the issue of climate change. Um, so what we, I think what we find is that this technocratic approach focusing on, on plan design and implementation by being able to find support through this direction um, is in fact heartening. And I do agree that this is an, an interesting research question to probe, but my baseline expectation would be that we would not see strong effects in the American context um, from such a design. But I think it's a really interesting idea to keep in mind. And the only thing I'll, I'll add is that I think there's there's probably two different ways that, that policymakers and activists could, could use our results. One way would be, you know, they might say that, okay, even though plans that begin in four years rather than two years might have a greater chance of actually passing. Beginning plans sooner in two years would have a bigger impact. And so let's push for that no matter what. On the other hand, you might try and sort of take opinion for what it is, as I think Hernan's comments sort of suggested we do and say, okay, if four-year plans are more likely to pass, and even though that's not necessarily the optimal you know, timing from the perspective of combating climate change, um, we should still advocate for plans that begin in four years because that has the greatest chance of, of passing. And so I think in our framing, we generally emphasize policies that have the greatest chance of, of passing because we think it'll be hard, as Sabrina mentioned, to really move people's preferences uh, very much uh, with respect to climate policy. So we'd rather have plans that, that pass rather than pushing for the most ambitious plans that, that may not be able to pass, unfortunately. I have another question regarding the how results can variate uh, across like regions. So I know that partisanship is highly, you know, like con conducive or like, or explain how people will think or how will views be shaped uh, in terms of climate change. But have you seen or have you found any type of variation across regions or across cities? One may think that even, you know, being a Republican or being a Democrat, Democrat can be affected, you know, by living maybe near the coast and being exposed to like natural hazards like hurricanes. Do you actually control for those kind of things or have you delved into that kind of a uh, question? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, so one constraint in, in addressing these regional or local effects is that in order to field our study on the sample of local policymakers, it's very important to preserve their anonymity. So we're not able to identify them locationally. Um, that being said, we do have some locality level data that allows us to try to 
you know, um, proxy for, for the, the position they are in the country and, and assess the effects of their specific locality on their preferences. So we are able to look at them by the percent urban in their location, um, their community's exposure to the effects of climate change through weather events like, um, oh, I believe we included floods, droughts, um, a couple other things. I don't, I don't remember the whole list off the top of my head. Um, and we also look at local industries, including whether there's um, um, local like automotive industry, oil industry, and green tech industries. Um, and so by capturing all these local level effects, we're able to see that there is, again, there's some variation in these subgroups, but not a ton. Um, we don't see like hugely divergent preferences across these different types of folks. There is still a lot of preference for ambitious plans and, and, and compromise policies. Um, but unfortunately, no, we're not able to subset for like coastal regions, even though we'd love to do that. We think it's really important to protect our sample and um, you know, make sure that future researchers are still able to ask questions of these folks um, without them being worried about being unmasked. Thanks. So, well, I have another question if you wanna, you know, we can discuss it. And it's related more to the policy implications and you know how this re this research can inform policy decisions so you clearly mentioned that you know those policies that have like short term costs will less will be less supported by you know policymakers and people in general which is i think understandable but but that does it mean that we cannot think about implementing those policies so the question here would be okay let's assume that people don't support these kind of like measures. So shall we stop thinking about it? Shall we stop thinking about like, I don't know, carbon taxes? So even though those kind of measures can actually have a positive effect in dealing with the climate crisis. So, and the other question would be, to what extent do we need the support of people when we know that these kind of policies are needed? And uh, because it's not about just the short-term consequences of this, but also the long-term benefits of like future generations. So I don't know if you have anything to say about that, it's mostly about like go beyond, like move beyond the research itself and think about in political in political terms. Yeah, and that's a really great question. I would say that in cases where there are good substitutes to a policy and there are alternatives that would be more popular, then we should we, we should support those policies. So, with the case of carbon taxes, because we found that um, subsidies rather than taxes have greater support among both the public and policymakers. And at least theoretically, subsidies should have similar effect at similar effects as carbon taxes. We think in that case, it's a pretty easy call to say that policymakers and activists should push for subsidies instead of, of taxes. And there might be some cases where there, there aren't good substitute policies. And so in those cases, you know, it might make sense for policymakers and activists to push for the more ambitious policy because there's no good alternative. But again, we think that when there's good substitutes, we think that um, policymakers and activists should really take into account what's more likely to, to be adopted. Um, I would just add to that. Um, I think that in a, some ways, we can maybe think about this as a scaffolding approach in that it makes sense for the, the first step towards policymaking to be on the things that are agreed upon. Um, and then if that experience goes positively, that could be a pathway toward greater cooperation towards more ambitious plans and a, a kind of second phase building on. But if we were to immediately jump to those types of things right off the bat, um, as Josh suggested before, um, you know, we might not get any plans adopted at all. And I think that that outcome of having no plan is worse than having a kind of medium ambitious plan. Um, and so I think that also touches on your second question of, you know, does it matter if there's support for these things, if it's what's good for everyone at the end of the day? And I think we see that clearly it doesn't matter whether there's support for the plans. Um, this was quite evident in the breakdown of the federal Build Back Better efforts, right? Because of the lack of constituency level support, we ended up nowhere. Um, and so I think that's the, the worst outcome. So I, I, I would kind of stand our ground and say that support for these plans does matter. Um, 
we I think that in some ways we would like to think, well, if if the public just takes this bitter pill and does what's good for them, we'd all be better off. But just realistically, given the political strength constraints we face, um, I don't think that's as likely of an outcome. Um, but I do think that it's a really interesting question um, in, in the way that we frame the policy implications of the finding and, and kind of contextualizing, you know, what does this mean for future debates? Should we stop talking about carbon taxes because they're unpopular? Um, no, I don't think that's the case at all. I think that we should keep talking about them as an ambitious, hopefully future target goal, but on the way to getting there, right, maybe we can take these intermediate steps first. And the last one that I have is related to, yeah, so I really like the paper. I, I want to stress this. So in relation to this discussion between like, so you find that there is a clear correlation between what people think about these issues and how they respond to these questions uh, and those responses from policymakers at the local level. So what are the implications of this about in terms of thinking like descriptive representation, like substantive representation, and also to what extent can we think of, you know, changing the status quo when you have so strong preferences, both at the level of policymakers, but also at the level of the constituencies. So how can we actually think about implementing new policies when you have like so like a strong commitments to like certain things. So I'll take the, the first part of your question, Santi, which is a really good question about descriptive uh, representation. So I think we're, we're, we're heartened by the fact that preferences between policymakers and the public are relatively congruent, because if they were very contradictory, then I think that would raise again, these kind of thorny questions about representativeness. I mean, if, if policymakers have very different views than the public, then it would seem like political incentives aren't really working and policymakers aren't really representing the public's views very well. And so from the perspective of, of democratic representation, we actually think that our findings are, are pretty optimistic on that front. Um, yeah, I think the only thing I would add is that you know, on this like descriptive versus substantive uh, representational difference, what does it imply if we've observed that these preferences are similar and yet to date nothing has been done about this? Um, I, I would posit that the reason for this lack of movement is probably second order beliefs that policymakers have about what the public prefers um, in that it's, it's, it's kind of a lack of awareness that this kind of agreement does exist. Um, and this is largely due to like media narratives about partisan differences and such like. But um, one thing that we're hoping to do in a kind of follow up to this study is to provide local policymakers with this type of information. And we expect that when they're informed about what their public, their constituents prefer, and that this agreement does exist, that they may go back with more willingness to actually do the work of implementation. Thank you. So now I have one question in the chat and then uh, Kanchi, I don't know if that is how you say it, uh, has raised her uh, their hand. So can I allow her to talk? I don't know if it's she or he. I think you're allowed to talk. Yeah. Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my name is Kanchi Gandhi. I am in the biology department. Both of you gave. Uh, as touched upon, the policymakers, regardless of the party affiliation, what they believe in, they just go fix that exists in their constituency because they, they won't keep winning, winning the election. For example, when President Obama, during Obama's time, in the initial time, they had the complete control of the House and the Senate. So now if they had they wanted, they could have passed all the legislations pertaining to what 
to the climate change. They didn't. Even presently, in the Biden's time, even though they have simple majority, still they can pass, but they won't rush anything because they need to be more realistic about winning the election. They may be believe, believing in the good concept, but not necessarily they will go for making all those legislations. And even the people, whether one, I have seen in my personal experience, let us say a worker who believes in climate change and who want to promote climate change, I'm giving a practical example. If the person goes to work driving about 30 miles each way, just because they want to live outside the urban area, they want to live in a big residence with a big backyard and front yard, then are they not contributing so now, to the carbon emission? So now, I used to wonder why, are, why you people drive such long distances in spite of knowing that you are emitting so much carbon. And then what is the point in supporting climate change when yourself being a small part of it in causing the pollution? There is no answer. They do not want to face such questions. They will merely say, oh, I support the, the, all the, all anything that is pertaining to climate change. I mean, these are just my comments that I have observed. Thank you. Thank you, Kanchi. You have any comments on that? Yeah, thank you very much for your question, Kanchi. I missed a little bit of the beginning because your internet was going in and out, but I caught I caught some of it. So um, I heard you mention the fact that you know, if you only have a very slim majority, say in the Senate right now, as Democrats have, then that may uh, force you to be more, you know, quote unquote, realistic rather than pushing for ambitious policy. And I think that that's right. Um, you know, if Joe Manchin is, is sort of the, the critical vote, then you're not going to be able to pursue as ambitious a policy agenda as if, say, like Amy Klobuchar was, um, uh, was the critical vote you had to win in order to pass legislation. Um, and in, in our study, one thing we do do is we, we measure whether policymakers believe that supporting climate policy would um, enhance their electoral prospects or, or undermine them. And that's another um, factor that we look at in our appendix to see how that impacts support for, for different policies. And of course, as you'd expect, policymakers that think that supporting climate policy would, would help them electorally are more likely to support um, more ambitious climate policies in general. Thanks, Josh. And we have another question in the chat uh, from Elizabeth. She's asking, where will you take this research next? Are there any research questions that, be, that still need to be answered? Uh, yeah, so thanks for this question. Um, I suggested a, a, a bit about one, one research avenue that we're interested in pursuing more, which is um, updating policymaker information about what their constituents prefer um, when it comes to climate plans and seeing how this actually implements their behavioral outcomes. We would love to be able to do some work looking at the actual implementation of climate plans at the local level to see um, how, how this matches up with these dynamics that we're, we're interested in. Um, and I think that one other question that we're still interested in, um, as I suggested before, is, is matching up these kind of choice, choice decisions with more information about the cost that would actually be faced and whether making the costs and benefits more salient um, affects individual decision-making. Um, although if there's additional research questions that anyone here thinks are, are really interesting directions for us to pursue, uh, we'd, love, we'd love to hear suggestions and ideas that this, this project has sparked for you. Okay, then. So I think this is a great way to wrap up uh, this, this talk. So thanks, Sabrina, and thanks, Josh, for this excellent uh, presentation. And thank, uh, thanks, everyone. I think I have another question. Sorry. Just a final comment from Hernan. Uh, he's saying preferences are not immutable. Challenge that is a good research point. 
Uh, so yeah, so again, thank you, Sabri, and thank you, Josh, for this excellent presentation, and thank you for all the attendees for being here. So yeah, have a great rest of the day.